good to be back here in the Lord's house again tonight. And I really do appreciate your willingness to come and worship the Lord and praise His name, hear from His Word. And so if you will please tonight, turn with me in your Bibles again today. And we want to look at a very special passage of Scripture from the book of Acts, chapter number 13. The book of Acts, chapter number 13. And I want to give you a few moments to find your places there. We're going to read the first three verses there in Acts chapter 13. And uh, boy, I tell you, God is so good to us, isn't He? Amen. Praise the good Lord. Praise the good Lord. All right. Well, if you will, please now stand with me, those of you that are able, as we read the precious and holy Word of God. Beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, it was called Niger, and Lucius, who was Cyrenian and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Terrat and Saul. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. I, Heavenly Father, it has really been a great day today. And Lord, I know that you have been here with us within our midst. Lord, you've touched so many hearts. We're thankful for that young lady that was saved this morning. And we're praying that many more are going to be saved, dear me, Father, through the drawing power of your Holy Spirit, the convicting power that the Holy Spirit has to show us that we are sinners, dear God, in need of a Savior. And Lord, tonight I pray the Holy Spirit will have free right away. And I pray that, dear me, Father, we'll continue to worship in spirit. I can continue to worship in truth of your word. And Lord, just use me as a spokesman, dear God. Lord, hide me behind the cross. Allow me to lift up Jesus Christ. And, Lord, what an honor you have bestowed upon me tonight. And, Lord, I'll thank you for what all is done. Because whatever is done, it is going to have to be done by you. I can't do it and no other person can. But, God, tonight, would you do the impossible? Would you do the Heavenly Father what no one else can in some way, some shape, or form? And, Lord, just prove and show to us all again one more time that you are God that you're still on the throne, and you still, dear Heavenly Father, love us all. For these things I ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. What a privilege we have tonight to gather together here in church. And tonight the Lord has led me into preaching concerning the church of the New Testament. And the church of the New Testament, as we're reading here in chapter number 13, started back in chapter number 10, where at Antioch, Peter had went and began to preach, and other things were being accomplished, great and honor things for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can see here that this church was a church of the New Testament. And I believe that God had set forth a pattern for all the New Testament churches to follow through. And when I look into this passage of Scriptures, there's many things here that we need to know about. First of all, this church was recognized as the first place that people were called Christians. In the book of Acts, chapter number 11, and verse number 26. And I know this is a very familiar passage of Scripture to all of us. And in this passage of Scripture, the Bible says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Up to that time, Christians had been called different names as far as being recognized as followers of Jesus. One of the things that they were called were the way, the people of the way. And there were other things that was used, but once they started calling them Christians, that has stuck throughout the ages. And the word Christian really, when it started out in Antioch, was really a slur. It was used by non-Christians. It was used as a way of mocking those that believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. As a matter of fact, if you go back into the Greek, you'll find out that it was more or less pronounced Christians. Christians. Here are some people like Christ. Here are some people like Jesus. And they mocked them and ridiculed them by calling them Christians. Christians. The one who died on the cross. Christians. Christians. But the really and truly Christian really comes as a, as a banner of honor. To those of us who follow Jesus Christ and who want to do our best to honor Him and to glorify the Lord in our personal lives. 
There's only two other places in the Bible where the word Christian is used. If you look in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 16, you'll find that there again it is being used. The Bible says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Now, Peter was warning the people that are going to be called Christians that not everybody's going to like you. And not everybody's going to accept you. There's going to be certain types of persecution. And they really know that through those times back in Peter's day, there was a lot of persecution that went on that led to many Christians being put to death. Well, really and truly, the times that we're living in right now, there's still many Christians that are being put to death. Matter of fact, today, somewhere in the world, there will be Christians who will be killed, who will be arrested, who will be imprisoned simply because they want to follow Jesus Christ. But the Bible here says, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Because I have been inspired myself from some who have suffered persecution. Some who have been placed in prison in Iran, in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia, and in China, and in Russia, and many other places of the world. And yet they are not ashamed of Jesus Christ, even though they're in chains, even though they've been tortured, even though they've been mistreated. Any time that they've had an opportunity to lift up Jesus Christ, they weren't sitting there trying to draw attention to themselves as, Oh me, oh my, and woe is me. They were there lifting up Jesus Christ and being steadfast in the fact that they still believed firmly that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that Jesus is the one who has saved their soul, and that there's a better day waiting for them. No matter what mankind tries to do to them, they're not going to change their mind. They're not going to recant. They're not going to change their faith. They're going to be steadfast and unmovable. What an example for us here in America. Because here in America, the types of persecution that we might face is nothing compared to the kinds of persecution that our forefathers and those that I have just spoken about are facing right now. We'll stand before God without being able to justify why we have not lifted up the name of Jesus before people that we've come in contact with. He is saying here in this passage of Scripture that if you suffer for being a Christian, don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ, but let Him glorify God on this behalf. Friends, we need to stop and think, in what ways are we really glorifying God in our lives? In what ways are we really lifting up the name of Jesus before people that we come in contact with. And I want you to search your hearts tonight. And I want you to be honest within yourself. Quit worrying about the person around you, but start searching your own heart. In which ways tonight are you lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ? In which ways tonight are you showing that you're not ashamed? And in which ways are you willing to go out and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I believe He's the Son of God, and I believe that He has saved my soul. Acts chapter 26 again tells us about the word Christian. The Bible there says in verse number 28, And Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me. Agrippa was under great conviction. Paul had been witnessing to Agrippa. Some of you know what it's like to be under such conviction that you can't hardly bear it. I mean, it's as if there's somebody is just grabbing hold of your soul and your heart and twisting it and turning it and, and squeezing it, and you realize you know that you are a sinner. You know that you're lost. You know that you're without Jesus Christ. You know that you're under conviction. But yet still you won't succumb. But still you won't surrender. Still you won't admit it to the Lord and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And come into my heart and save my unworthy soul. Here the Bible says that Agrippa was in that same state that many of us have found ourselves in in times past. And Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. 
As far as I know tonight, Agrippa was never saved. As far as I know right now, Agrippa is in the pits of hell. And there he's been in flames for thousands of years, wishing that he had that one moment that he could stand once again before Paul and give him an opportunity that he might confess, Lord Jesus, I've been wrong. Lord Jesus, I've been a sinner. Lord Jesus, save my soul. Don't you think he'd like to have that opportunity tonight? Don't you think he'd like to have another chance tonight to be saved? But he didn't have that chance. He can remember that day, though. And I believe there's a lot of people in hell tonight that can remember the day that the Holy Spirit of God almost persuaded them to be saved. But now they're in hell because they remember also how they rejected Jesus Christ as the Savior. A lot of people who have attended church services Reject Jesus Christ. Conviction falls upon them. They know that they are a sinner and undone without Christ. But yet they don't want to give their heart and their soul to the Lord to save their precious soul. They walked out of churches time and time again, lost as they walked in. And then the time comes when the time has run out and expired. And they open up their eyes in hell only to wish, Oh my God! Oh, have mercy on me. Oh, God, give me a second chance. But I want you to know tonight that there's not any second chance. Once they wind up in that lake of fire, once they wind up in that place of torment, they rejected Jesus one time too many, and now they're there. Oh, Agrippa said, almost, almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Friends, let's look tonight and see what makes a great church. I believe that what makes a great church, first of all, is that they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I believe there's no substitute for believing in Jesus. I believe there's no substitute for raising up Jesus Christ before people so that He can draw all man unto Himself. And I believe this church in Antioch is a church that no doubt believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I believe for the most part this church at Antioch was a united church. Now I want to tell you tonight that I don't believe there's no such thing as a perfect church. I don't believe that there's a such thing as everybody always going to be getting, away, around, uh, getting, to, getting along 100% of the time. But I want to tell you I believe this was a united church but kept the main thing, the main thing. And I believe that if we're going to have a successful church, or any church is going to be successful like the church of Antioch, we're going to have to keep the main thing, the main thing. There's always going to be times that we might not agree on this, and we might not agree on that. Lord, behold, I've told you before, there's been some times I hadn't agreed with myself. They sometimes I can't believe I thought that. They sometimes I can't believe I wanted that. And they sometimes I've changed my mind and, and realized, my goodness, I, I, I wasn't thinking clearly or something. But here I want to remind you, friends, there's going to be times when, well, we might not agree on everything, but we better keep the main thing the main thing. And I want you to know that this church at Antioch, they kept the main thing the main thing. Now, when they met and started out at Antioch, they started out in a house. And in that house, they began to do one thing that must be the main thing that is going to be carried out at any church. The main thing that needs to be carried out today in any assembly. Do you know that's what the word church means? Simply an assembly. Friends, we can gather out there in that arbor and we can have church because there's an assembly of God's people. We can gather together up there in that tent in Burlington that they had not long ago, and we can have church because there's an assembly of people. The building and the stained glass windows doesn't make it a church. It's the people that gather together in an assembly that makes it a church. And the thing that causes a church to be able to spot a dysfunction in the Spirit of the Holy Spirit is that we keep the main things, the main things. Don't forget that if you don't remember nothing else. 
keep the main things, the main things. And the main thing that they really had in common in the church in the New Testament is that they believed in preaching. They believed in preaching. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse chapter number 11, and verse number 19, the Bible tells us there that they that which was settled abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Peneus and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. They started out preaching only to the Jewish people, but now at Antioch they begin to preach to us. The Gentiles. And aren't you glad tonight that the Lord came to save everybody? Not just the Jewish people. Because they might not be any Jewish descendants here tonight. But I know there's a lot of Gentile descendants here tonight, and I'm one of them. I mean, there might be some Jewish blood in me somewhere. I don't know, but I'm just saying as far as I know, I, I'm, I'm Gentile. And the Lord cared about me just as much as He cared about His chosen people. And Jesus on that cross died and shed His blood just as much on my behalf as he did for Abraham. How about that? He shed his blood on that cross for me just as much as he did for Isaac, as he did for David, as he did for Saul and Solomon. But isn't it good to know that we have a God that loves us just as much as he loves anybody else? The Bible goes on to tell us in the book of Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. The Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You know what it takes for our faith to grow? The Bible says here that it comes and it grows by hearing the Word. Now, how does hearing the Word of God help our faith to grow? When I read the Bible, I see people going through similar circumstances that I face myself. Matter of fact, I don't believe there's anything new under the sun. I believe everything that you face and everything that I face in my walk of life, that there has already been faced by somebody in the Word of God. And when I read about these circumstances that other people are facing, and I see how great my God is, and I see how powerful my God is, and I see how that my Lord never forsakes us, He never leaves us, He never abandons us, Friends, that encourages my faith. That helps my faith to grow to know that just as much as he loved Abraham, he loved Steve. And just as much as he looked after David, he's going to look after Steve. Just as much as he was there with me, Shake, Shadrach, and Abednego, he's going to be right there in that fiery situation with Steve. Just as much as he's with Daniel in the lion's den, He's going to be there with John and Tanya and Ann and Geneva and Roger and Linda. He's going to be there with us through those times. And he has proven to us time and time again what he has already done before. He is still in the same business today. And not only is he still in the same business today, he's going to be there tomorrow, still operating, still in business, still looking after us, and still doing for us. Friends, it's through the Word of God that our faith can be encouraged. It's through the Word of God that our faith can be strengthened. And I am thankful when I can listen to a preacher get in that old precious book and begin to expound how that God knows our circumstances and our situations and how that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that God cannot come alongside of us and be with us through whatever situation that we might face. Jesus said in the book of Mark chapter 16, and then Mark 16 verse 15, He says in this passage of Scripture, and He said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that's the Great Commission. We're studying about the Great Commission now in early worship. It's entitled Go Paul, and we've announced that. And it's telling us how to be a witness. And I'm telling you, it's a powerful, it's a powerful series. And we put it on Facebook. You can go home and check it on Facebook. And you can follow along on Facebook, Greg Lawrence. And I'll put it on there. I'll keep putting it back on there. He's asked us to keep putting it on there. He wants people to know how to be a witness for the Lord. 
because there's so many things at stake. Because God has commanded us to be a witness. Do you not believe that, church? He's commanded us. What did that passage of Scripture there say? And He said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28 tells us to go out. There's a great commission. Do you realize, and Greg Lauren brought this out, and it hit me like a ton of brick, that if we're not out trying to lift up Jesus before other people, we're sinning. We're sinning. They expressed what it meant to have the sins of omission and the sins of... Uh, there's some things that we know we shouldn't do, and we do it. Well, that's sin, right? God said, don't do this, and we go ahead and do it anyway. Then that's sin. But He also, the Bible tells us about the sin of omission. There's things that we know that we should be doing, and we don't do it. We omit it. Well, that's still sin. And when God says for us to go out and be a witness, He really intends for us to stand before Him one day and give an account as to whether or not we fulfilled the Great Commission to tell other people about Jesus Christ. We're to preach the Word. The church of Antioch, don't you like, wouldn't you like to have stood under Barnabas? Wouldn't you have liked to have been there when them great preachers and prophets of God would stand up and proclaim the truth about God? Well, the Bible tells us here to keep preaching the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse number 2. The Bible there says, Preach the Word. Well, I'm telling you, I was listening to somebody just a while ago. They were sharing with me how that, man, it's getting hard today to turn on your radio, hard today to turn on your television, and hear preaching anymore. Now, there's a lot of services that go on. There's a lot of institutional religious ceremonies that go on. But there's just not a whole lot of preaching going on anymore. A lot of them old preachers that we grew up listening to and admired and really were moved spiritually through, they've died and they've gone on. But today I'm here to tell you that the same need today is the same need it was yesterday, the same need that Antioch had, Alcoma Hall Baptist Church has, and they need to hear the Word, preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove people, rebuke people, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're living in that time. People don't want to hear doctrine, but the Lord says for us to preach doctrine. There are certain things that are the main things. And those things that are the main things are things we are to stick with. And keep preaching on. Keep telling on. It's the blood. It's Jesus. There is no other way. Friends, those things are the main thing. You're not going to go to heaven by any other means but through Jesus Christ. Friends, preach the Word. The Bible warns us in verse number 4, chapter 4 of Timothy. It says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fable. Then if I was a good storyteller... And I could get up here and tell you about a story for about 30 minutes. I believe this church would fill up to overflowing in no time. Because today, in this time in which we're living, people just want a little tickling of their ears. People want just a little patting on their back. People don't want to hear doctrine about hell. They don't want to hear about the blood. They don't want to hear their sinners. They don't want to hear that they've got to be saved in order to get to heaven. They don't want to hear those sort of things. And so today, churches or assemblies of some types or another are filling up mainly because somebody there is trying to be a philosopher or trying to be a psychologist or trying to give them some soci sociology or things of that nature. Friends, all those things, they might be helpful for the flesh, but only your soul is going to be helped through preaching. Preach the Word. Be thou, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of their ministry. Pre preaching pleases God. Amen. Preaching pleases God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians one twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know that they'd be people... But if they had come here this morning, they'd have walked out of here thinking that's the craziest 
preacher I ever heard. If I'd have got preaching about the rapture, there'd have been, and there might have been some even here this morning would think when he gets to preaching about the rapture, he must be crazy. He gets to talking about there's going to be a trumpet sound and there's going to be a shout come from glory and all the saved are going to raise up, go through the ceiling, meet Jesus up in there. Friends, there's a lot of people that think that's foolishness. There's a lot of people who think that hell's foolishness. When I preach about Satan and the devil, there's a lot of people who think, well, that's foolishness. That's foolishness. Well, the Bible says that that's going to come along. But the Bible says, don't change the story. Keep on preaching. God likes the preaching, and it pleases God. Man, I'm here to tell you right now, that's what they did at Antioch. Friends, it looks up Jesus Christ. Preaching looks up the Lord. Friend, God told Jonah to go back to Nineveh and preach. Jesus preached the kingdom of God to others when he was here on earth. Friends, I want you to know something, that it's an honor to be called a preacher. A preacher is a proclaimer. A preacher is a messenger. That's all we are. We're proclaiming the truth. We're pro pro proclaiming the Word of God that has already been given unto us. But not only was that a church that really believed in preaching, it was a church that believed in soul winning. A church will die if people don't reach out to lost people and try their best to win them to Jesus Christ. Churches are going to close their doors this year. Thousands, thousands of churches are going to close their doors this, week, this year and probably today because they just don't have anybody coming. And the reason why that a lot of them are having to close up is because the church became satisfied with the status quo, us few and no more. They become satisfied with the fact that, well, we're happy with just a small number now, and, and they don't go out and try to tell anybody about Jesus. They don't reach out and try to share the gospel with anybody, and the church dies. What a shame for that to happen. The Bible tells us about the great number that believed in the book of Acts, chapter 11. And I don't have this, Randy, on the overhead, but in 11, verse number 21, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Friends, I believe all my heart that God's given this area an opportunity to win people to Jesus. There's a drawing presence of His Holy Spirit. Some of you may not have been able to tell it, but you might not be spiritually where you ought to be. But for those of us that are spiritually where we should be, and we can tell that there is a supernatural power. The Holy Spirit of God is doing a supernatural work. And I believe that we're experiencing maybe the last round of it. The Bible says in the latter days, I'll pour out my Spirit upon men and women. But they'll be very able to go out and tell people about Jesus. And I believe with all my heart we're seeing a lot of people saved. Not only here at this church, but other churches around the area. We're seeing a lot of people saved. And I believe with all my soul that the Lord today is drawing people to Him. And I believe surely that soul winning is one of the main things that we need to keep the main thing. But do you realize the statistics here today shows us that 95% of the people who proclaim to be Christians Never win one soul to Jesus. And you wonder why churches are dying. Five percent of the people that attend church or call themselves Christians through their lifetime actually win somebody to Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm telling you, it should be our number one priority. The Bible tells us again, John. Uh, again, uh, Randy, you'll have this. John chapter 15, verse 16, it says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. There it is again. God has given us what? A commission. God says, You didn't sign up possibly for it. I chose you. You didn't choose, choose this. But I'm telling you, I've set you aside to bear fruit. We're all to bear fruit. But 95% of us ain't. 
95% of the church one of these days is going to stand before God with blood on their hands. The blood of lost family members. The blood of friends. Who they should have witnessed to and told about Jesus, but you didn't do it. Well, I'm telling you right now, we're to bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask in the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that wins souls is what? Only five people, I five people out of a hundred are winning anybody to Jesus Christ. Only five people out of a hundred. That's a sad state to be in. One of the reasons why I guess that some of us are not winning people to the Lord like we should be is because we need to ask ourselves, as one of the main questions that was brought out this morning in the service in early worship, you've got to care. You've got to care. And if you don't care about lost people, you're not going to be motivated to tell them about Jesus and the only way of salvation. And friends, there's lost people all around us. I could ask you tonight, do you know of somebody lost? And I'm sure every person would be able to raise their hand and say, yeah, I know somebody that's lost. And I believe we could probably think of many people that are lost. Our neighbors. A lot of people in our family. Some of the friends we grew up with. Some of the friends we have right now. Some of the people that you work with. Could be some of your children. It could be some of your grandchildren or great-grandchildren. Do you not care? What are you waiting for? Somebody else to come along? How many of you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, I don't know how to tell them or what to say. Lord, would you send somebody by? Well, that's a great prayer, and I'm glad you at least prayed in that prayer. But why can't grandmother tell them? Why can't grandpa tell them? Why can't dad sit down with them and mom? Why can't you sit down with your best friend? Why can't you go to your neighbor? You'd go over and ask them if you needed something, or if they needed something, they'd come ask you. But why can't you tell them? Maybe you don't have that confidence. Maybe you don't know exactly what to say. You better be finding out. Because time's running out. And friends, there's only one way of salvation. And quite frankly, if you know how you got saved, you're without excuse as to why and how to tell somebody else to get saved. Because they can't get saved no different than you did. And if you know how you got saved, you should be able to tell them how that they need to be saved. Friends, not only were they a church that preached the Word, not only were they a church that was concerned about souls, I want you to know that they were a church that believed in teaching the Word. And I believe that there's a difference between just teaching sometimes and preaching. I really do. I believe that men are called to be sometimes teachers and preachers. And the Bible here tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26, the Bible there says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Alvin and I was talking a while ago at the deacons meeting, Sunday school. Man, I don't know what it's going to take to get people interested in coming to Sunday school. Golden opportunity there to learn the Word of God. Not only for the adults, but for the young children as well. And today it doesn't seem like people are just as interested in learning about the Bible. But we ought to be interested and we ought to know more about what God has to say. And so we ought to take opportunities and advantage of opportunities when somebody is willing to study and to make preparations to bring across a lesson that would help us all greatly. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It was a teaching church. It was a church that knew the importance of sharing things that need to be taught and people need to learn. But not only was it a teaching church, it was a giving church. It was a giving church. Acts eleven twenty nine goes on to say, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Friends, I'm telling you, in this day and time which we're living in, friends, it takes money. It takes money to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ in many cases. I mean, honestly, to send people out, to send missionaries to different places, Friends, they were missionary-minded. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 2. 
And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. See, I tell you, a church is a church that cannot be contained within the walls of that building. We should be outside the walls of the building, reaching people for the Lord. But not only should we be reaching people for the Lord and out to my hall, I mean, really and truly, if we really put down our, our made up our mind to reach people out to my hall, and if all the people that come to this church were determined to reach everybody out to my hall, we could about do that in a week. I mean, a good week. We ought to be setting our minds not just on out to my hall area. We ought to be setting our minds on Alamance County. We ought to be setting our minds not only in Alamance County, but we ought to be setting our minds on North Carolina. We ought to be setting our minds on the United States. We ought to be concerned and open to God's leadership. And thank God, over the last eight, nine months, so many have been called from Altamont Hall Baptist Church to minister to people all over North Carolina and even as far away as Arizona. It was a mission-minded church. It was a given church. But it was also a praying church. You want to know what is the least attended service that we have at Altamont Hall Baptist Church? Wednesday night, what? Prayer meeting. And wouldn't you think that the prayer meeting would be one of the most vital times to gather together as people give out the information about prayer concerns, people that are afflicted, people that are sick, people that are in need, people that need to be prayed for and things of that nature, and it's the least attended service. Acts chapter 13, verse number 3. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Friends, I tell you right now, you're missing out a lot when you just don't pray like you should. But here's another thing that this church had that made it such a New Testament church. And remember, these are the main things. We're not ever, all of us, going to agree on everything. Some of you right now are too cold. Others of you are too hot. Others of you wish you'd have stayed at home. Others of you wish I'd be quiet and let's go ahead and go home. We're not always going to agree on all things, but here's the essential things we've got to agree on. We have got to have the Holy Spirit. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. The tent moved on about a week ago. But I don't think the Holy Spirit moved on. The Holy Spirit is still around. We're seeing souls being saved. I'm hearing about other churches. Souls are being saved a lot of other places. And that's because of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. But if we're not careful, there's going to come a moment when the Holy Spirit of God is going to be quenched. And I know what it's like to be in a time when it seems as if though the Holy Spirit of God doesn't have liberty. And if you have any spiritual discernment at all, you know there's been times that you've experienced in your spiritual walk that the Holy Spirit of God has been quenched and even grieved. And if the Holy Spirit of God cannot move and operate, then there's not going to be people getting saved. There's not going to be a lot of rejoicing and praising the Lord in the churches if the Holy Spirit of God is there. Matter of fact, if the Holy Spirit of God is not there, we're wasting our time. If we get in a service and we don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, the best thing we can do is have an altar call and call people to cry out unto God and to ask God to please send down the power Please allow your Holy Spirit to fill this place. Allow your glory and your power to radiate in this place. Because sometimes it seems like, in some occasions, not many thank God, but there's been times it seems like they have been an evil presence. An evil power. And we needed to realize that and be crying out to God and say, Almighty oh, God, defeat this evil. The 
church of Antioch, they were led by the Holy Spirit of God. But the Holy Spirit of God says to Nancy, sing this, that's what we want her to do. The Holy Spirit of God tells me to preach this, that's what I want to do. But the Holy Spirit of God says, sit there on that stool, Steve, and don't you move until everybody's heart get right, then that's what I should do. Because I to be wasting my time and your time trying to plow through granite, trying to get across a point that's not going to go no further than, than, than I'm standing right here if the Holy Spirit of God is not in it. The Bible says in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. And I believe the Holy Ghost should lead every servant. I really believe that. And I don't think the Holy Spirit has to be led by a bulletin. And I don't think the Holy Spirit should be uh, contained by some formality. I think we need to just be open and, and be receptive of when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us. But you've also got to acknowledge that there's probably been times the Holy Spirit of God's asked you to do something and you didn't do it. So what did you just do? You just quenched the Spirit. There's times that the Holy Spirit of God might have said for you to sing, Alan. And if we don't do what the Holy Spirit of God says, then we just quench the Spirit. Not that Alan's been out of people to But sometimes the Holy Spirit of God has moved you to at least raise your hand you didn't do it. If you can't do the simplest things, he certainly ain't going to expect you to do the things that really require faith. He may have even said for you to say amen, and you sat there and didn't do it. The Holy Spirit of God may have moved on your heart, come to an altar during the song, during the prayer time, during the sermon time, at the end of the sermon, and you didn't do it. We've got to stick with the main thing when the Holy Spirit of God speaks. We need to be obedient to what God is leading us to do at that time. Amen. There again, the Holy Spirit of God says, Steve, you sit there like they're not on the wall until people's hearts get right. That's what I should do. They were a church that believed in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Isn't that wonderful? And that's the kind of church service I like to be. When the church keeps the main thing the main thing, and that's preaching, and that's caring about the Word of God, that's teaching the Word of God, that's caring about soul being saved, that's caring about sending forth and sending out missions and sending out people and, and encouraging them to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the church of the New Testament, a church that believes in praying, a church that believes in being under the anointing and the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the New Testament church. And that's the main thing. Let's stand to our feet at this time. And let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we looked into this passage of Scripture tonight, and we've seen how that the church of Antioch was such an example of what a New Testament church should be. Oh, I'm sure, God, that they had problems. I know that we've seen other situations in the churches at Jerusalem where, you know, there have been murmuring and things of that nature. And, and I know, God, that there's no perfect church. And I know that there's times, dear Father, that we're going to be cold and some are going to be hot and, and so forth and so on. But, dear Father, I really believe that if we'll focus our heart and our attention on the main thing, and the main thing, of course, is Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary and the blood that He shed for our sins. That's the main thing. Salvation, dear Holy Father, of lost people is the main thing. Preaching the Word of God, Almighty God, is the main thing. Dear Holy Father, praying is the main thing. Dear Holy Father, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to lead us and for us to surrender our will unto your will, that's the main thing. Lord, I pray that tonight you'll speak to our hearts. Whatever it is that might be, in our hearts or whatever it might be that we need to do. Almighty God, speak to us now and lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. For these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord speaking to your heart tonight and you feel like you need to come. The Holy Spirit of God. Don't come unless the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you that it's time to humble yourself. It's time to bring that burden to Jesus. It's time to come and ask Jesus for help. It's time to seek Jesus' face. It's time to come and thank Him or it's time to come and ask Him to save your soul. What is the Holy Spirit of God leading you to do tonight? Is He speaking to your heart? If the Holy Spirit of God is not speaking to your heart, then that ought to send off an alarm in your soul. What is it that you're missing in your spiritual walk with the Lord? Is your prayer life not what it should be? Are there times that you have quenched the Spirit in your life? Are there times when God is trying to help you and to lead you and to guide you and you've not paid it any attention? Has your heart's grown cold and calloused about the fact that lost people are going to wind up in that terrible place called hell? What is it that the Holy Spirit is trying to renew in your heart and your life tonight? What are in these areas that we've spoken about that are the essential things, the main things, that we need to take closer attention to and apply our lives better to? Whatever it is that God's speaking to your heart about, if you have the need to come, why don't you come tonight? Why don't you come? Our Heavenly Father, as we bow with these who are coming tonight. Bless your hearts for being here this evening. I hope you all have a great week. And I want to challenge you. I challenge early worship to lift up Jesus Christ before at least one person this week. I want you to really set that as a goal in your life. Tell somebody about Jesus this week. Don't forget this Saturday about the back to school bash and all the children and young people that are going back to school. They'll come. they got a lot of supplies and things they want to share with them a lot of good times, a lot of fun and things of that nature, bouncing house and all that. You know, help them get some books and papers and pens and pens. I think all these different things of that kind of what y'all are aiming at to help them out, give them that boost, get ready to go back to school. And uh, so let them come and let them experience that wonderful blessing of how God's people, through God's love, wants to share with them. All right? Let's bow our heads now. Our Heavenly Father, would you please go with us now? And I pray that, dear God, this week, you will put within our path someone. That dear God, that we can lift up Jesus before. That we'll have the opportunity to plant some gospel seeds, dear God, on fertile ground. And maybe even, glory to God, be able to lead them to Jesus Christ for their salvation.